Uh, since it's kind of a smaller group, if you guys want to stop and go on a tangent or something or have some experience to share, that's totally fine. Interrupt me at any time. But this is the agenda I wanted to cover today. Spend a little time talking about what NoSQL is. So how many of you are familiar with NoSQL already? Okay, most of you. So maybe we can just breeze through that section pretty quickly. Let's talk about some of the security problems that have been very publicly experienced in the last year, although some of more recent security issues have kind of eclipsed those, but uh, what, well, what are you going to do? And then uh, I called it a demo, but it's really just kind of a walkthrough of what I did and, and something you can follow along with during the session if you want to. Uh, you just need a cell phone, really, to do it, um, so it's not that big a deal. And then we'll talk about what can we actually do about this problem going forward as a developers, as industry, as uh, companies, as vendors, things like that. And then we'll have some time for, for Q&A at the end. We're here at CodeMash. I don't know which of these sessions are going to be recorded, so I put this slide in here for those watching at home. Uh, check out CodeMash.org. It's my favorite conference. We're here sponsoring as well, so I took some liberties with a little CodeMash logo and added a Couchbase gear in there. I hope you guys don't mind. Uh, my name is Matt Groves. I'm a developer advocate for Couchbase. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I tweet a lot. I have a podcast and a blog. If any of you guys are interested in being on the podcast, uh, please let me know. I'm, I'm going to start recording here uh, later this month, so I'm looking for guests right now. And I'm not an expert about anything, especially not security. I'm far from a security expert. So if you came here to hear a security expert talk, go to another room. Uh, but I am enthusiastic about all kinds of technology, and that's why I do the podcast, that's why I do developer advocacy, because I just want to, you know, I, I'm enthusiastic about this stuff, I want you guys to be as enthusiastic as me. So that's, that's what I'm all about. This picture I did not draw, you can tell because it's actually good, but most of the pictures in this session I did draw myself, so um, please be kind with your, with your feedback. Uh, and by the way, just a reminder, there is a feedback uh, in, in the CodeMash app, so please use that. I also have a little feedback link for you at the end. So the one for CodeMash is great for the organizers. The one that I'm going to give you at the end is, is great for me. And also give you a chance to win some money. So um, pay attention to that near the end. So intro to NoSQL. First, a brief history of NoSQL. 3200 BC, the invention of writing. Does not involve any SQL to store that data. Right? So NoSQL is as old as civilization. But, uh, you know, less, less silly. Let's go up to 1957 here, skip forward. We have the IBM Sabre. It's the first commercial use of a database by American Airlines to help with uh, ticket reservations. It was not a relational database. It was more like what we consider to be a file system these days. Very hierarchical piece of data there. And it's not until 1970 then that EFCOD proposes the relational model. Not even SQL itself, but the relational model of storing data. And then in 1979, we have the necessary sacrifices made to the dark forces for Oracle to be released with their commercial launch. Microsoft follows suit later in 89 with SQL Server version 1. All this happens pre-web. So these database systems were designed before HTTP really came around and made an impact. So post-HTTP, we see 2005. People start looking at some old ideas, because there's really nothing new underneath the sun in computers, just new names for old stuff, right? Uh, CouchDB came as a result of people looking at, uh, anybody familiar with Lotus Notes? Yeah. So Lotus Notes did some very interesting things with how they stored data. The, the email client leaves a lot to be desired, but the very cool storage systems. So CouchDB was inspired by the way Lotus Notes was storing and distributing data. So they uh, released an open source project called CouchDB. And then in 2006, 2007, Google and Amazon are really starting to struggle with, well, I mean, before this, they're struggling with keeping their databases online, keeping their websites up, because even a minute or two of downtime for these guys is a huge impact on revenue. So they were working on these things called Big Table and Dynamo, and they released these white papers in 2006, 2007. And those led to what's, what someone called the NoSQL Cambrian explosion of open source projects. React, MongoDB, Cassandra, Redis, those all started around 2008, 2009. And in 2010, the heavens open and Couchbase descends to the earth. Uh, that's the disclaimer that I work for Couchbase, by the way. So that's the history of NoSQL, but in my mind, if you go to couchbase.com, you'll see NoSQL everywhere. 
but it's a term that I don't really like that much. It's not a very useful term. So I mentioned the invention of writing. I also want to tell you about my NoSQL toaster. I can store data in it in the form of bread. I can retrieve data in the form of toast. None of those operations involve SQL. So it's a NoSQL toaster. Pretty useless term to describe something. So I want to like to break it down a little further into these more specific categories of document key value, wide column and graph. A uh, show of hands earlier said you guys are mostly familiar with NoSQL, so I'm not going to dive into that too much. I'm going to focus mainly on document uh, in today's presentation. But this is why it was originally called NoSQL, because those core operations did not involve writing any SQL queries. It was get by key, and, and maybe there's some map reduce in there as well. And it's come a long way since then, uh, as, as you'll see in the session today. Um, so anyway, that's where the buzzword comes from. I don't like the buzzword, so I like to use these more specific terms. And it, it's helpful. If, you, if you're communicating with somebody else in person, you say, oh yeah, we're using NoSQL. That could be any number of these different things. So it's more helpful to say, oh yeah, we're using a document database. Oh, we're using a graph database. So it's a little pet peeve of mine. I like to try to get people to do that. So why NoSQL? Some, some of you are using NoSQL already. Some of the broad reasons people try NoSQL out is that it's designed to be scalable. And I mean horizontally scalable. You can add additional nodes to the cluster. And this turns out to be kind of beneficial with the, uh, the whole uh, specter thing going on. But that's beside the point. Uh, it's easy. It's easy for developers to get started and to start throwing data into a database. They don't have to learn a SQL query language. They don't have to learn about third normal form and, and tables and foreign keys and all that stuff. Newer developers, they understand JSON because they're going through boot camps, learning Angular, things like that. So they can start throwing JSON into a database. And then fast. Speed is another reason why people look at NoSQL databases. They're optimized for certain design patterns or for certain access patterns to get data very quickly. Uh, some of them are very memory uh, focused, so it's very quick to get operations in and out of memory. And so that, those are some of the broad reasons why people look at NoSQL. But what I want to focus on today is this one. NoSQL databases are easy. What makes them easy? So we already talked about scaling. Some are easier to scale horizontally than relational databases. You can scale relational databases, yes, it is difficult. Uh, it's like a round peg in a square hole sort of thing. So that is an easier thing to do with relational. Uh, it's easy to throw data into. I mentioned that already. You can just start tossing JSON in. You don't have to worry about um, adding new columns, things like that. You don't need a bunch of database theory to get uh, going. And number three, it's easy to install a lot of these and just get started. You, know, you can get a Mongo instance going in you know, less than a minute and start using and putting data in it. And that is a trade-off that has really driven a lot of adoption. Mongo, for instance, is by some measures maybe the, the most popular NoSQL database, maybe the fourth most popular database in the world right now. Uh, so, but this is a trade-off that's driven adoption, but it's also been a little bit of a problem. So why are vendors, let's talk about why vendors are making this easy. Why are these databases so easy for people to use? Well, the reason is because there's a long history of relational database since around 1979 or so. People are used to that. So if, they, if you want to convince them to use your database instead, you have to make it as easy as possible to get started. For new and junior developers, you want to make it easy for them to get going. Because if they hit a roadblock early on, they're going to switch to something else until they find an easy path. For architects who are maybe, you know, have some experience, they're evaluating these tools. You want to make sure they're up and productive in evaluating the tool as fast as possible so that they're more likely to choose your tool to bring into their enterprise and eventually become a customer. And then creating prototypes is an important thing as well. So if you're like in pre-sales or you're, you're trying to do a proof of concept for a customer, it's easy to get them up and running. But these trade-offs can be really dangerous. These easy trade-offs. That's one of my themes today is that we've maybe swung a little too far in the easy direction. What we end up with is some security problems. And these are not complex, specter, meltdown style attacks. These are really fundamental, basic security issues that are happening because maybe it's a little too easy. So if you've been following the news, last year, a lot of these databases have been hit by ransomware attacks. 
So this is an article from the register. 27,000 different MongoDB instances were compromised. Why? Because the default configuration is insecure. When you install Mongo, you get anonymous administrator access right out of the box. So you don't need a login and password, you just need to know where it is. Now, fortunately, they have made changes to that, and I'll talk about that later. But that is what led to these uh, initial uh, problems. Not just Mongo. Redis was also targeted last year. Same reason. Redis is designed to be accessed by trusted clients inside trusted environments, which means if it's exposed to the internet, you can do whatever you want with it anonymously. Elasticsearch also been hit. Same exact reason. People were putting it on AWS, assuming that Amazon's going to secure it for me. Nope. So it's just open out for anyone who knows where it is to go in there and log in, take your data, leave a ransom note. Hadoop is another one. Not really traditional sort of operational NoSQL database. So typically this should be definitely not exposed to the internet. But guess what? People were exposing it to the internet. There's no authentication on it. And people can just get in there and steal the data. We could keep going. CouchDB, another one that was hit. There's an example of the ransom note right there in an, an article I found on, on CouchDB. And it's the same exact vector as MongoDB and Elasticsearch, just unsecured by default. Now, I work for a company called Couchbase. We've been very lucky to not be in the news, but it's not for lack of trying. So this is some documentation from an older version of Couchbase. And I think if I can zoom in here, you can see that if you install Couchbase and go through the default wizard, hit next, 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 what you could end up with is a default bucket, which is a data store, that has no password on it. So you could just, if you know where the database is, you can log right in, get the data. Now, we've been lucky because we've been very proactive and we're not quite as exposed as the others, but it's entirely possible, in fact likely, that this has happened. We've just not been, we're not a big enough target that we made the news yet. So kind of good for us. I do a podcast, and I was lucky enough to have uh, Wolfgang on the show once to talk about encryption and things like that, but I asked him while I had him on the show about this problem. Why are these databases being deployed with no password? What is going on here? Um, and I cut this from the show because it was unrelated, but I asked him for permission to, to quote him here, and this is what I said, basically that we don't have time. We're not building this into the process. We just follow the same blog posts. And I, I suspect there's also, we're on teams where there isn't a person responsible for security. Uh, or we think we're a safe, low priority target. And it's not gonna happen to us because we're just, you know, we're, we're a small company. They're, they're not gonna come after us. And we don't spend time training new developers, junior developers. We just hire them, put them in a chair, and say, you gotta be productive right away. And we need you to start billing hours now or even senior developers for that matter. We don't give them the training they need to keep up with new tools and new things that are happening. They don't understand what's going on. They don't have time. They follow the blog posts and they end up with a exposed database on the internet. So that is my hypothesis. That's, that's my, my theory for today. I thought I would try this out in the wild though. So I, I asked Bill Sem for some advice on this. I wanted to set up my own MongoDB instance on the internet that's unsecured and just see what happens. Um, so, here are the steps I took. First, I installed MongoDB Community Edition. And if you notice, if you go to the documentation, you see this warning right there. It says, do not expose Mongo to the internet unless you put some authorization, some security on it. So it's right there in the docs. So we're not reading docs, clearly which is, shouldn't come as a surprise, right? Now, uh, all the details of what the exact commands I did are in the notes for the slides if you want to do the exact same thing I did. Uh, and I will say that MongoDB has responded to this issue 
they have now made some changes to make their database a little more secure by default. So this is not an accurate experience of what you do today if you're installing the latest Mongo. Right? But I installed this on my home network, first of all. And Bill said, Matt, you might not want to do that because some of these things can maybe lead to, you know, some sort of network hijacking and things like that. So I said, okay, all right. He said, put it on Azure instead. So I fired up a VM in Azure, I installed Mongo on it, and there it is. It should be up right now. There's the IP address for it. And if you guys want to try, go in there, see what you can do. If you're familiar with Mongo, it should not be that difficult. Um, if you want to play along, you just have a phone with you. Here's an Android app called Mondo Ex or Mongo Explorer. Free install, you can do it right now. Um, please be kind, don't put any profanity or anything in there, um, or delete everything, at least until the session's over. I'm gonna tear down this VM after CodeMash. Um, now, with this specific client, you might need to know a database name. Uh, that's not what Mongo needs to know, it's what this client needs to know. So put in a database name local, that's a very common default database name. That's not where my sensitive data is, but that is a place you could try as a default sort of uh, database. So anybody following at home, that IP address, Mongo, if you need it, database local. All right. So I set up a MongoDB instance on the internet. Then I went and generated some data. And I went to this site called json-generator.com, very cool site. You give it a little template, it'll create some JSON data for you. I wanted to create some data that actually looked useful, valuable, credit card number, birth date, contact info, uh, all this sort of stuff. So that's the kind of data that I have in there. It's all fake, it's all generated, but that's the sort of the data that uh, I wanted to look like in there. So I saved that into a file called generated.json. Then I used the Mongo import utility in the command line to import that JSON file into a database. Very easy to do, take a JSON file, I put in a database called come and get it in a collection called credit cards. Um, so that's, uh, that's easy. The one thing I needed to do, now this is where you might say, all right, Groves, you're, you're really pushing it now. This is, this is not something that everyone would, would do. This is not something that uh, a newbie would, would think of doing. On Azure, I had to set up port 27017 to be allowed to the VM that I put Mongo on. Right? Otherwise, because Azure by default closes off the ports and says you can't do any ports unless you specify otherwise. And you might say, okay, well, Groves, that's, that's not going to happen. No one's ever going to do that. They're just going to install it on Azure. It's going to be fine because it's behind the Azure firewall. Everything's going to be fine. And you might be right, but I submit to you this. And this might be a little hard to read in the back, but if you go to the Azure security network settings, you can, there's a drop-down list you can select from. One of the options is MongoDB. A lot of other options up there, too. So this is not that far-fetched to me that people would say, okay, yeah, I use MongoDB, I'll select that one, done. Once I did that, my MongoDB instance is now exposed to the internet. Uh, one other note, there's a tweak in the, and again, I, I'm trying to be fair because I know they're a competitor to us, so I want to mention these things. MongoD.com, it's a config file. I had to modify this as well. And I think my, I had to remove the local bind IP setting. And I, my thought is that this was a setting that they went back and changed retroactively because of the recent security issues. So again, I'm just kind of, kind of simulating what the world was like, you know, six months ago. Um, so I want to mention I did that for sure. That's a setting that Mongo will only accept connections from localhost. Um, so either they retroactively changed this, or maybe a lot of developers were doing this themselves already. Fo again, following those same blog posts that everybody else is doing. So I have all the details again in the notes if you want to go through the same steps as I did. So if any of you have followed along, you might see something like this. I tried to access this database from my Android phone. I wanted to make sure I was, there was no overlapping of network, that I was legitimately outside of Azure and, and accessing it from the internet. That's what I saw. So if anyone else did the same thing, this is probably what you've seen, unless someone's gone ahead and defaced it in the 10 minutes since I gave you the IP address. I can view the data, I can edit, delete, update, add my own data in there, whatever I want to do, because there's no authentication. There is no user, it's just anonymous admin access. 
And just to show you, these are some of the logs that turned on verbose logging to show you that, yeah, again, kind of hard to read, but it was getting six records at a time, which is what the mobile client does, grabs six records and shows them on your phone screen. So that's kind of the equivalent of a page. So yeah, the log shows that this is what exactly what was happening. So Honeypot done. Now, I turned it on, and I left it on for like a month and a half before CodeMash, and I was extremely lucky because I didn't really attract any bots or anybody to deface my data. So I had to get more creative. I, I posted on Twitter. I said, hey, here's for the CodeMash Capture the Flag competition. Why don't you guys use this as a warm-up? Uh, so finally someone did. Shannon Code here, which I think I met this person earlier this week. Um, they did it. They found it. And they posted a screenshot of the data they found. This is, not, this is not difficult. This is not rocket science. If Shannon, are you here, by the way, Shannon? Okay. I was going to have Shannon be an expert witness, but I didn't show. So there we go. That's all I did. And now I have an unsecured MongoDB honeypot exposed to the internet. Anyone can get my credit card data. not just me. There's a site called Shodan.io, S-H-O-D-A-N-I-O. I'll give you a link later on. These guys are kind of like a search engine for hardware. They scan IP addresses, find ports that are open. This is a map I took a few weeks ago of unsecured MongoDB instances. Just MongoDB. It does not include Redis or Couchbase or anything else, just Mongo. Some of these are honeypots, I'm sure. Some of them might not have any real data in them. I don't, I don't recommend you do this, but you could go to the site, find IP address, connect to these databases, and see what's in them. And my guess is if you were to hypothetically do this, you would see a lot of ransom notes in those databases. Mine never got attacked, so maybe I did something wrong, or maybe I just got lucky. I don't know. But check out this site. It's a little, it's a little frightening to see all what's, what's out there that's, that's public. 61,000 Mongo. Okay. So, what can we do about this? And by we, I mean developers now. I want to talk about developers first. So the first thing we do is move to North Korea. They have no problem at all with this. Totally safe. Not a single MongoDB instance exposed there. Um, but fundamentally, the issue here is just put a password on your database. Um, that is a, a, at least a good first step in the right direction. So use a password, even if you aren't planning to expose your database to the internet. Uh, because someone who doesn't know better might expose it accidentally or on purpose because they're working on some other problem. They don't have time to think of all the ramifications. And when you're putting a password in your database, hopefully you aren't like President Scrooge here and using a password like 12345. And more importantly, not using a login like administrator. I'm extremely guilty of this in blog posts. All of my examples use administrator and password. Because this, the core point of my blog post is not to talk about all the security stuff, okay, and then here's how you do this one Angular thing, or here's how you do this one web API thing. I'm, in my blog post, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't do this, I'm assuming that you know enough not to use that as a real password. But this has got to be a problem as well. Use a different username as well. These are easily guessable usernames. Use something different, more unique than that. That's going to be, that's going to prevent a lot of these honeypots from being out there, or a lot of these um, accessible MongoDB instances. So that's the first thing we can do. Second, let's talk about injection. You guys have probably all seen this comic from XKCD. It's a classic. I'm using NoSQL though. There's no tables, so I'm totally safe from injection, right? They, they, they can't drop a table because they don't have a table. Well, um, I'm sorry, that's just not the case. With MongoDB, there's a query API. Here's an example of one, I think this is correct, where I can do a where statement. I can say where some condition equals some other condition. If that condition is exposed to user input, Mongo can actually evaluate JavaScript server side execute these queries, and what I end up with at the bottom is the same sort of injection you'd see with your standard SQL injection. So how do we deal with that? This is on by default, JavaScript evaluation, 
is on by default in Mongo. So here's the, what they suggest to do. This is what Mongo suggests, I believe. Is one, turn off JavaScript evaluation on the server side. Just turn it off. There's a setting you can do that. It's on by default, you can turn it off. Two, don't use the where. Because you can evaluate JavaScript there. there may, there's probably some other way you can get to the data without using Mongo's where. Those are the two things they recommend. A third thing you can do, and I don't recommend this one, you can try to sanitize the input yourself. And say, okay, I'm going to parse this, look for special characters, uh, convert it to an integer, whatever you have to do to make sure that input is sanitized from the user. I don't really like this course of action because the, I have to be right every time. The bad guys have to be, can only, can, they only need to be right one time to get to an, an injection point. Uh, fourth, you can use uh, some sort of uh, library that wraps this. With, Mon with Mongo, it's called Mongoose. There's a node library for that. So you can, you can wrap this sort of functionality and, and abstract it away and let it do the escaping and stuff for you. There's similar libraries for other languages, I'm sure. So that's with Mongo. Couchbase, we have a full SQL, ANSI SQL query language for our NoSQL database. And so therefore, traditional injection is completely a possibility. Again, no tables, but anybody see the problem with this query up here? Should be pretty obvious if you've ever seen SQL injection before. If username or password are malicious, you can end up with malicious SQL statements. Solution is just as easy as it is with standard databases. Parameterize. So I have token username, token password. I swap those out for parameter values. Easy peasy. This is easy to spot, easy to fix, but you have to actually do it as a developer. Can't just string a whole query together and assume because there's no tables that I'm not vulnerable to injection. So that's pretty easy to identify. Another thing, and this is not specific just to NoSQL, but it maybe is a bit more of a problem. So look for PII. Anyone heard the PII? term before, you're going to start hearing a lot more if you haven't. It's personally identifiable in information. So for example, unencrypted social security numbers for these gingerbread people up here. Uh, it's, a, it's in a relational database, this can happen too. You end up with data that you weren't necessarily expecting to be in there, you don't want to be in there. Credit card numbers, social security numbers, etc. With a NoSQL database, a document database, it's a little more risky because with a SQL table, you can maybe put a process around, okay, if you want a social security number column, you have to go through a DBA or something to get approval to add that column. So that's going to stop it right there. With NoSQL document databases, the developer is more directly in charge of what types of data get stored. So a developer could just start throwing in socials or whatever they wanted to in, in their code. Alternatively, if you're using NoSQL to do data ingestion, which is a very big use case for NoSQL, you're getting data from a bank feed and throwing it into NoSQL just to ingest the data and then process it further down the line. If they change their feed later in the week to add some PII to it, now you're, unbeknownst to you, you're getting PII into your database as you're reading that feed in. So there's some risk there that could end up in your database. So this is not possible in relational either. So it's good to actually take a look at your data, not just the column names or the field names, but the actual data values. Do they match the format of a social security number or a credit card number or some, some other PII like that? And then just do a regular audit of that to see, is, is, is this data ending up in my database somehow? Okay, the next thing, this is probably the most important thing, is to do security audits on your projects, on your product, on your code, on a regular basis. Now, I don't speak of from a position of authority here at all. I've never really been on any development team that's done security audits uh, in, on a regular formal basis. I've been, it's always been ad hoc, if at all. And I, I just want to clarify here, I work for Couchbase right now and we have extensive security audits. I'm just not on those teams that do those. So I, I'm not familiar with 
with uh, I see all the documents and stuff, all the output of those processes, but I'm not familiar with the actual uh, process and team itself. So with a security audit, I think there are some things you can do on a regular basis. Just you can start small, but start doing these on a regular basis. So first of all, you have to have someone who's responsible for security. Now everyone on the team should be responsible, right? But someone who's in charge that says, okay, I am going to make sure we implement these types of uh, practices from, from now on, or I'm gonna have them you know, started up in a month, month from now, and I'm responsible for them. Maybe this is a rotating basis, or maybe it's uh, you know, one, one day a week a person does this sort of thing. But you need to have someone who's pegged as the responsible party. Automate as much as you can into your CI CD pipeline. Code analysis, checking for those settings like JavaScript evaluation, if they get flipped back somehow, check for those. Check for the localhost only setting with Mongo in case someone decides to flip it back accidentally or on purpose. Look at your log analysis and automate this. Look at your logs to see what's happening. Are we getting hammered by some a DDoS attack from a certain IP address, or is someone log, trying to log in you know, 600 times in a row, we need to look at these things and maybe take some action, maybe at least raise an alarm, or temporarily blacklist the IPs, or what, whatever you want to do, but look at those logs and understand what's happening to your server. Look for PII, automate this analysis. Don't just run a query one time and say, oh no, we're clear, we're good. Maybe a month from now, someone puts a bunch of socials into your database. So automate this analysis if you can. So look for that PII, raise the flag. You may get some false positives, that's fine. But it's better to know than to just assume. Try some fuzzing and automated exploits. I'm sure there's other sessions at CodeMash about this today, but these are tools that can generate inputs in an intelligent way to your programs to try and identify different exploits. And by the way, also identify some bugs for you along the way as well. So you get a double benefit here, not only security issues, but also finding uh, maybe logic issues or other types of bugs. And finally, since I'm not an expert, hire an expert to come in and maybe get you started, get you on the right track. Uh, if you're handling sensitive data at all, then the cost of the consultant is going to be far less than the cost of disclosure, legal fees, rep reparations, credit monitoring, all that stuff. So my Mongo honeypot didn't get touched at all in the month and a half. Maybe I'm lucky, but I really can't present to the CEO and say, oh, our plan is to hope no one notices us. So get something in place, start small, you don't have to boil the ocean, just get a process in place on a regular basis. Okay, I want to take a, a brief side note here and maybe uh, let you guys ask some questions, but I also want to just say that I am a big advocate of document databases, NoSQL. They are not just a liability. I know I've, a lot of scary stuff here so far, but sometimes they can have benefits. So I remember at a CodeMass session, I think last year maybe, someone was talking about the proper way to hash your passwords. If you're storing credentials, then you should be using some sort of hash to do that, right? And the thing is, hashes have something of a shelf life. After a certain time, they get broken, or they expire, or computing power has caught up to them. So if anybody's using MD5 for hash right now, you can leave right now and go change that, because that's been out of date for a long time. But if you have a system that has MD5 encoding, you have to migrate it to some other hash. And you need a typically user interaction to do this, to create a new password, that sort of thing. This can be a real pain in the neck if you want to add new columns or try to figure out, here's my password column, am I using the old hash or the new hash? With a flexible, like JSON-based model, you can just add new columns, add new fields, as you need to, and you can easily identify which customers have been migrated, which ones haven't, and it's a very easy thing to do. Anyway, that's just a side note. I wanted to make sure you guys know that there are some benefits. It's not all liabilities here. Okay, so any questions so far? So what can we do as vendors? We could require authentication, first of all, right? This is getting us away from the easy 
into the safer by default. Require a password. I know that seems extremely simple, but it's something that not everyone does. Require authentication. Um, so for, for one, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, all those guys, they had a 30, 40 year head start on this new wave of databases. So they have a ton of features they've baked in over those decades. Uh, they have a lot of years on, that, on the current crop of NoSQL databases. So we have to, again, carefully balance those features being added, the trade-offs, the cost to us as a small organization, just trying to stay profitable, trying to stay in business. Uh, but as far as security goes, I think NoSQL vendors have a lot of work to do. Now, I'm happy that Couchbase has added role-based security to our latest version. It's something we've not really had before. So you can give out authentication you know, credentials to a certain party that they read only credentials or they don't, only these guys can do queries, that sort of thing. So that's a helpful step in the right direction. But there's still a ways to go. Another thing you can look at for these is managed hosting. A lot of people go this route and they say, okay, well, I'll, I'll use Cosmos DB or I'll use MongoDB's Atlas, which is their database as a service, and I'll let them handle the security concerns. And I'll hand it over to them. They can handle it. Now, this doesn't mean it's always going to be more secure. So we talked about the injection stuff earlier. I mean, they really can't stop that sort of thing from happening. Um, so you still have to look for injection. You still have to do security audits, things like that. But you don't have to worry as much about things like upgrades and patches, um, things like that. Now, again, Couchbase is kind of lagging behind here. We don't have a managed database as a service yet. It's something we're definitely working on creating, but these are a couple options Microsoft and Mongo have. Safer by default. So umpires used to look like this, I guess, but not, not so much anymore. Um, I, I suggest, again, that pendulum start swinging from the fast and easy, let's get it out the door right now, more towards the, let's make it a little safer by default. Uh, require passwords, we're seeing a little of that. So Couchbase, you no longer can access data without a set of credentials. Require strong passwords. We're not, we're not there yet. Couchbase, I can still use password as my password. That's not good. Um, this is probably the toughest thing though because the database market right now is very competitive and every vendor wants to rope in the new user and making it harder for them, safer by default, is, is just making it more likely you're gonna go to a competitor. So you guys are in here, you care about security. Not everybody else cares about that as the first concern. They wanna get the, the story card done as fast as possible. Uh, so again, I'm just one person on a small team in Couchbase uh, at a relatively small company. My input means something, but it means even more when a potential customer comes to me with an email and says, I won't use Couchbase because of this reason. That's a tangible thing I can pass along to PMs. And it's something I, I solicit from people all the time when I'm at booths and events. I need your guys to tell me what is important to you. Because I think I have an idea, but it's, it's better if I can bring evidence. Um, so unless it's something like, oh, I won't use Couchbase until you have tables, well then, I'm sorry, it's not the data for you. All right, any more questions on that? Or, or comments for that matter? So we covered developers, we covered database vendors. What can the industry do as a whole? And so I see, I'm, start, I'm gonna start to get a little preachy here, so forgive me, uh, but I'll bring it back around to security. So I, I hear a lot of chatter and I see news about shortages of developers, a developer deficit, um, or a shortage of good developers, or a shortage of affordable developers, these sorts of things. So lately, at least in the market I'm from, the area I'm from, people I talk to, it seems like everyone is always hiring, always looking for developers. Um, but what I haven't seen a lot of is willingness to hire developers that need mentorship, that need training, that need apprenticeship, so it's just more like, you know, there may be some lip service along these lines, like, oh yeah, we're gonna give you a mentor, or, you know, a token mentor that you have lunch with once a month or something like that. But none of them really have any teeth to them because it costs money and it costs time and everyone is too busy, right? Because it's not, mentorship doesn't just cost the company time we're paying someone who's not billing, it also costs us the senior developer's time because he's not billing while he's mentoring. So there's this expectation that we want to hire people who maybe not necessarily be productive on day one, but can start billing on day one. Okay? So we're in a rush, 
We have a developer who doesn't have time to learn because learning is not billable. They lean on Stack Overflow. They lean on Google, blog posts, and they figure it out for themselves. And they're following my lousy blog post that says use administrator password as your credentials. And what do we end up with? Those news articles from earlier. And so there's this thought, okay, we, we want us to spend money, great. What if we spend all this money on these people and they get all this training and then they decide to leave to go to Google and Microsoft and they leave us? What happens if we don't train them and we stay? So I suggest we start developing more mentoring programs. We emphasize billable hours, maybe a little less. If you're truly investing in the long term, you shouldn't expect those results right away. There's going to be a ramp up period. So this is going to improve the quality of your people and your process because you're going to build yourself a process that can take someone from junior or entry level and build them up. And you can be able to re repeat that process as you go. What if we don't train them and they stay? It's going to cost you anyway. Here's some examples of security breaches, not necessarily NoSQL security breaches. Equifax, a big one last year, cost some estimates $87.5 million. That's what the New York Times is saying. Target, from a few years back, cost $148 million or more. Now, these are just the nominal costs. I also want to talk about the other costs. Maybe some of you stopped going to Target completely because of this breach. You don't trust Target anymore. That hurts their reputation. That hurts their future revenue. Or Equifax is a name now synonymous with total lapse of security, messing everything up. Equifax, actually Couchbase is proud to have all of the credit reporting agencies as customers. But we had to scramble quickly to get Equifax logos off of our stuff. We weren't responsible for the breach at all, but if we had that logo on our material, we're associating ourselves with a fiasco. That is a damage to Equifax that you really can't count with you know, legal fees and, and uh, credit reporting. Volkswagen, not really a security issue, I don't think, maybe, but 18 billion. Maybe because inadequate mentorship or you know, pressure to get something done fast, be billable right away, and it costs them 18 billion and growing in the long run. And I found this interesting graph. The average per capita cost of a data breach over the last 12 years. So this is per person. 225 bucks a data breach. How many users do you have of your system? You breach their data, that's what the cost is. I suggest that training and mentoring and taking your time is going to save you money in the long run. Unless you're just taking reckless risks and doing that sort of thing. So, Spend the money on the mentorship program. Give it some teeth. Don't just be a token effort to put people in chairs. Actually build your people up. All right, I'm done preaching. For that, uh, that's, that's pretty much all I have to talk about. I'm just going to sum up right now, but any more questions or comments before we go? So just to sum up here, NoSQL, a term I really don't like. Stop saying NoSQL. Use one of these terms over here instead. It'll make communication a lot better. Because you say NoSQL, you might mean Hadoop. He says NoSQL, he might mean Cassandra. Be more specific. Security, be on guard. This is just, should be on every security slide uh, you ever see. Vigilance as a team, that's the price of security. Especially with the newer software like NoSQL, where you don't necessarily have 40 years of track record. Uh, Make sure you know what's exposed, why, and how it's protected. Don't make assumptions. Um, make security part of your process. So add those audits. Put someone in charge of the audits. Automate as much as you can so you're not spending time doing rote tasks trying to find things. And don't make assumptions about security. Don't assume AWS is going to protect your Elasticsearch for you. Don't assume there are no in injection vectors because you don't have tables. Don't make the assumptions. If you guys are using NoSQL, go check it right now. Run out of this room and go look at your, uh, if, especially if I mention one of the tools you're using. 
Make sure they're secure. Make sure they're behind a firewall. Make sure they have a password. Make sure they're up to date. So here's some of the resources. I think I mentioned a few of these already. Shodan.io is the website with the cool maps. This next one here is a, is a tool to automatically uh, exploit and map NoSQL databases. I think it's just supporting Mongo right now. They're going to add CouchDB, Redis, Cassandra in the future. I would submit a Couchbase request, but I don't know Python. So if some of you knows Python, create a plugin that for that for uh, Couchbase. Um, Martin Fowler, hopefully a name you hopefully know. He's done a lot of writing and evangelism around NoSQL. Definitely check him out if you're not familiar with NoSQL. He does some great overviews of this other stuff there. And I mentioned Wolfgang Gerlich a couple of times. Definitely check out his blog. He's got a video series on security, InfoSec. It's, uh, it's a great uh, resource there. Uh, I'll do a quick plug for Couchbase here. Please go to couchbase.com, download it, check it out. Let me know what you hate about it. Tell me so I can let project managers know. You don't have to download it, actually. You can go and try it out on Azure, Amazon, Google Cloud. Try it for free on there. Uh, this is a new thing I'm trying. Please go to this link here and fill out a survey. It's a, literally a one-question survey. And you'll be entered to win a $100 gift card at the end of the year. I'm filling out one question. This helps me out a lot just to get feedback so I can tell my bosses, like, oh, yeah, I got these many people that came to my session. They fill out this thing, and they thought I was really good or they thought I was really lousy. That sort of thing. Helps me out a lot. So please do that. Make sure you use the code MASH2018. That's just for you guys in this room. Don't share it with your friends because it makes your chances go down that you'll win $100. You can find more about us, Couchbase. I do a lot of blogging at blog.couchbase.com. I do a lot of tweeting at mgrobes. My team that I'm on it tweets at Couchbase Dev. This is my family. My enormous head barely fits in the picture with them, but uh, they're lovely. Okay, and these are the questions I get asked pretty much constantly, nonstop. So you guys can ask anything you want to, but I have slides prepared for all of these questions I get asked over and over. Number one, how is Couchbase different than Mongo? I've already answered this question about 50 times at the booth today. By the way, come by the booth for some swag. Enter to win the Lego Minecraft. I like to break this up into two different areas, architecture and features. Because features can change, but architecture is something that's very difficult to change. Uh, Couchbase is memory first. Everything goes through memory and gets written to disk asynchronously. So very, very fast operations there. It's a master-master. Every node in the Couchbase cluster can do reads and writes. It's not a master-slave type situation. There's not replica sets. Sharding is automatic. You don't set up any sharding yourself. It's automatically sharded out amongst all the nodes in the Couchbase cluster. As far as features go, my favorite thing about Couchbase is this first one, SQL. We call it Nickel. It's an anti-SQL implementation that works for JSON. If you want to learn more about that, I've got a session tomorrow, 4 o'clock, querying NoSQL with SQL. We also have a built-in full-text search that's similar to Elasticsearch, built right into Couchbase. And we also have a mobile database that can be used to you know, write, read and write data offline and then sync back to your data center when you're online. So those are the, the it's not everything, but those are the high level things, the high level differences between us and Mongo. Okay. Go for licensing. Okay, so Couchbase server community, free, open source. You can put it in production if you want to. The binary release is one behind enterprise except for major versions. So 5.0 just came out, so you get 5.0 community. With server enterprise, it's mostly open source. There are some pieces, and this is true starting with 5.0 and later, that are closed source still. Um, and then some features are not available on community. So in terms of security, this one might be the most interesting. So there's a thing in Couchbase called XDCR, Cross Data Center Replication. You have one cluster here in, say, the West Coast, another cluster on the East Coast and you want to sync the data between those or transfer some subset of data between those. That's called cross data center replication. With community, you cannot use TLS to send that data over. So you send it over in plain, unencrypted formats. So if you wanted to do that and use the free version, you'd have to go through a VPN tunnel or something, or unless you don't care about people seeing your data. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yes. Between the nodes themselves. Um, hmm. I don't see why. I think you can install certificates that are local to the cluster itself. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that'll, I think that'll work okay. Uh, I'm not 100% certain about that. Um, but cer certainly accessing the data, not between data centers, but if you're, like your web app to your database, for instance. That's all over TLS. That's in community as well. That's, that's just table stakes to me. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're holding HTTPS ransom for a basic hello world use case, that's just no good. So that's totally fine with community. Um, yeah, but for enterprise, you need a commercial license to go into production. If you could want to play with it and dev test QA, we're not going to come after you with a fleet of Oracle lawyers. Try it out, production, or try it on dev test QA. You just need a license for production. Um, and we provide paid support plans as well. Couch based, same thing as Couch DB. So, just a brief history lesson. There's this open source project called CouchDB. There's an open source project called MemcacheD. These projects still exist, All right? Back in the mid 2000s, there were some companies that formed to provide support and you know feature development for these tools. One's called Couch One around CouchDB, MemBase around MemcacheD. These companies looked at each other and they said, "Hey, we've got some peanut butter and chocolate. Let's get them together." So they merged. Took the couch from Couch One and the base from Membase and created a brand new product called Couchbase Server. So it's not a fork of MemcacheD or CouchDB. There are some pieces that are in there that go back historically to those, but it's, it's long since diverged from CouchDB and MemcacheD. Uh, for instance, CouchDB is on version 2 just recently, Couchbase is on version 5. So there's been a lot of iterations, a lot of major changes since that merger. But it's still very confusing because this couch is in the name and CouchDB is still around. So I get that question all the time. All right. I admit, I answer this one, I guess, but no, we don't have one. Uh, longer answer is we have a, a third party that can manage the couch space for you. It's not really the same thing. The longest answer is if this is interesting to you, let me know what's interesting about it. Come talk to me after, afterwards because this is something we're working on probably this year. Okay, uh, you guys can feel free to ask more questions, but I just want to take a second to say thank you. There are a lot of tremendous speakers in this conference right now in other rooms. I really appreciate you guys being here with me, and I thank you for letting uh, Couchbase be part of CodeMash, letting us sponsor everything. So thank you very much. You guys enjoy the rest of the conference.